My name is Paul. I'm the chair of Climate Union's Achievement Week 2004 committee. Tonight, I'm honored to be able to welcome you to this event. Tonight, we launch an important event in the history of our chapter, the inaugural Carter G. Woodson guest lecture series. Before we commence, I will attempt to answer a question that was asked to me today by several students while I was giving out flyers. Who is this Carter G. Woodson? Well, first and foremost, this man was a member of the greatest fraternity on earth, the Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated, founded 103 years ago yesterday. This man was the second black person in history to receive a PhD from Harvard University. 89 years ago, he started Negro History Week, which is today known as Black History Month. He toured the world from Malaysia to France, studying the education system of these different countries. Later, he went on to supervise the entire education system of the Philippines. He also started the oldest black publishing company in America, Associated Publishing. He was also the Dean of the Liberal Arts at Howard University. He was a senior columnist for Marcus Garvey's newspaper, Negro, Negro World. He wrote over 18 books on black life and history. However, this same man was forced out of the NAACP because he focused too much on the study of race and black history. Further, they claim that his method of the advancement of black people were way too radical. In response to his critics, he stated, let us banish fear. We have been in that mental state for over 300 years. I am a radical. I am ready to act if I can find but few brave men and women to help me. Today, we, the brothers of Kai Mimi chapter, are ready to act. We are ready to help. And that is why we sponsor this lecture series in the name of our great brother, Carter Goodwin Woodson. Without much ado, let me hand you over to Dr. Hodge, the president of Kaimimu chapter, who will introduce our guest speaker tonight. Uh, good evening, folks. Good evening. Good evening. All righty. Um, it's, my, it's my pleasure, my honor, my privilege to, to introduce and present to you one of my esteemed colleagues at the university. Dr. Kendi Andrews is a senior lecturer in, in sociology at Birmingham City University. His research specialism is race and racism. In 2013, he published the first book documenting the history of the black supplementary school movement in the United Kingdom, entitled Resisting Racism, Race, Inequality, and the Black Supplementary School Movement. A champion and strong advocate for the cause, Dr. Andrews is determined to get black studies on the national curriculum. Prior to joining our university, Dr. Andrews was previously a lecturer at Newman University where he worked with children, young people, and families and criminology. He completed his PhD in sociology and cultural studies at the University of Birmingham, the other university, <laughs> submitting a dissertation entitled Back to Black, Black Radicalism, and the Black Supplementary School Movement. Kendi is currently engaged, I believe, in a project examining the role of black radicalism, focusing on organizing against racial oppression. He's interested in supervising postgraduate research in the areas of race, ethnicity, and racism. Black studies and how communities overcome inequality. His areas of expertise include race, racism and ethnicity, black studies, ethnography, community activism, scholar activism. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to welcome Kehinde, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrews to give this lecture. Okay, thanks for the 
introduction. I have a lot to live up to. It's the longest introduction I've ever had. So I, like, um, I guess that means that's good things, I suppose. I was at a conference once, and I was introducing an American professor, Professor Elijah Anderson. And I didn't know what to introduce for him, so he just said to me, uh, read out my Wikipedia page. And so I had to literally have it on my phone, and this, page, this was about three pages long. It took me, it literally took me 10 minutes. I mean, reading on my phone, this guy is distinguished, this distinguished there. So thank you for the long introduction. It makes me feel a bit too privileged, all right. So anyway, what am I going to talk about today? A case for black studies in the education system. This is not just a theoretical discussion. It is we are starting, have started a black studies association in Britain, the first of its kind. We had a major conference last year. We're going to have a major conference next year, a two-day conference called Blackness in Britain which brings over some African-American scholars. Professor Patricia Hill Collins, if anybody knows black feminism, is going to be our like, major keynote. So this is a real thing. Black studies, why do we need it? How will it help? Et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to talk about three general things. One, I'm going to start about saying education system. What do I mean by the education system? People mean different things when they say education. I'm going to spell out exactly what I mean. Secondly, then I'm going to say, what do I mean by black studies? What is it? How can we do it? And then the third thing I'm going to say is, well, once you say we have black studies, how can black studies help with some of the problems I'm going to outline in a minute? All right, so the first thing is education system, the problem with the system that we have at the minute. And I'm going to start this by making a, um, a big distinction between, on the one hand, education, and on the other hand, schooling. And what we have in Britain is we have a school system. It's a very, <coughs> very well entrenched school system, a relatively new school system, but it's a school system. And schooling and education are very, very different things. Education, when we talk about education, we talk about that as being something which is liberatory, as something which is about equality. Schooling is none of those things. School systems and the way that schools work, one of the first myths we have to get out of our mind is that schools are for equality. In fact, schools are quite the opposite. The school system exists to entrench inequality. It does not exist to make things any more equal. Now, this is an important thing to say, and it's an important distinction, especially as black people. We came here, our parents came here, you know, migrated into the country for some reason, for the for a main reason of jobs and schooling, right? Education, get into the system, move up the system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Over the last 50 years, there's been huge movements for equality in schooling, access to schooling, as this is going to be the thing that's going to make us better, give us more access to things. But if you look at the last 50 years, what's happened, it can only, you can only draw the conclusion that the school system is to entrench inequality. It isn't actually what's going to overcome inequality. Uh, this is part of my, partly what my research is based on, was looking at the uh, supplementary school. Do you know what supplementary schools are, Saturday schools? Saturday schools are basically schools which the African Caribbean community, also African communities, basically every minority community has had some kind of supplementary school to say, well, there's certain things that aren't taught in the mainstream schools, so we have to teach them ourselves. The difference with the, the black supplementary schools is this wasn't primarily about culture or language and trying to maintain those things. It was actually because the schools were so racist in the 60s, 50s, 60s, that 70s now, they were so racist <laughs> that, <laughs> that um, our children literally couldn't get equal education. So actually the purpose of the black elementary school movement hasn't been primarily about culture. It's been primarily to say the schools aren't working, they're not teaching our kids, therefore we have to teach them ourselves. Yeah? And that problem is equally now, is I did the research there for the book, which I meant to bring and always forget. So if anybody does want a copy of the book, it's called... Um, you told me what's going on now, I've forgotten. It's, it's called <laughs> Resisting Racism, Race Inequality, and the Black Elementary School Movement. I have two, it's, it's usually a bit expensive, like £24, but I have £16 copies. So if anybody does want one, just find me afterwards, I'll sort you out. And what I did with this, we looked at the history of Saturday schools, um, and the underlying thing that came across was the reason they existed in the first place is still there now. If you look at inequality, uh, particularly related to the black community, it's, the problems are basically the same. It manifests slightly differently, so... In the 60s, there was much more overt racial inequality, right? So it's unlikely, though not impossible, if you have a child in school today, the teacher's going to call them a nigger, right? That's not likely to happen, but it could happen. It does still happen, right? So those kind of things happened more back in the day, right? You also had what we called educationally subnormal. At one point in the 60s, up to 70% of black Caribbean boys were being deemed to be educationally subnormal, which basically meant um, 
retarded in those languages back in the day. Yeah? Yeah. Literally, 70% in Rongo was African Caribbean. So you had much more extreme end of, of oppression. But if you actually look at the achievement gap, that's relatively stable over the last 50 years. And exclusion rates, again, is relatively stable. And what we've, so what we find is 50 years, lots of money's gone into it. Well, not lots of money. Some money's gone into it. But there's been lots of campaigns around it. The schools have tried to do things differently in some extent, to some extent, but it hasn't worked. And what I always get criticized for when making this argument is I'm not blaming teachers for this, right? There's lots of teachers who try and do good, good things, lots of black teachers who try and do good things. This is a systemic problem. This goes to the heart of what schools are about. It's kind of like being in the police, right? You might join the police force and go, well, I want to be a, I, I, I'm a nice police officer, I'm going to do the best I can. End of the day, you're still a police officer, right? End of the day, the police force is still an oppressive force. It is exactly the same way with the schools, and we just have to start thinking about it like that. The schools are an oppressive force in our communities. They are not about equality, <coughs> even though there are people who work in schools who are very much about equality. Right. That's a bit of a controversy, so we, we can talk about that afterwards. But absolutely essential to what I'm talking about in terms of black studies. So schooling, we have to understand schooling in, in a different way. There's a whole radical literature on schooling. Someone called Ivan Illich writes a book called De-Schooling Society, which I recommend you read, excellent read. And basically what he says is that if you look at when, why schools emerge, universal schooling, and how they emerge, again, they're about entrenching inequality. How old do you think the education, how old is the school system in Britain? Universal, everybody goes to school. How old, how old is that system? 100 years, that's, that's, that's way too long. There's a lot shorter than that. How old is it? About 70 years. 70 years, yeah, it's around about, it's close to that. 1944 was the Education Act, Butler Act, right? Just post-war. Post-war, everything around welfare state is post-war. So we're actually talking about a system, we think about the school system as kind of being something that's there, taken for granted, it's always been there. It really hasn't always been there, right? There's about 10% of the population is older than the school system. So it's a relatively new thing which has happened and developed that everybody will go to school. Yeah? The rhetoric around schools is that you get everybody in, you get everybody to read and write, you get everybody in education, this will help inequality, etc. If you actually look at the reality of it, as I've said before, it, re it entrenches inequality. And how does it do this? It, Illich calls it, it credentializes, it gives people credentials. So for example, I have a PhD in sociology. Therefore, got, therefore at the top of the education system or school system, this means I deserve to get well paid. If you do not have my credentials, you do not deserve to be well paid. Right? Does that make sense? So we have a system where we hand out credentials to people and then we justify the inequality. Right? So if you don't have any credentials and you don't have a job, don't complain. Right? Because that's your own fault. You go and get the credentials and then you will get up in society, etc., etc., etc. This is the system that we have maintained. Now this is problematic for a number of reasons. It's not equal. The way our access to these credentials is fundamentally unequal. Yeah? If you go to the wrong kind of school, if you are from the wrong kind of family, if you are wrong, in the wrong area, if you there's lo loads of things which come into the account to say that we're not on a level playing field. Yeah? So we've got a system which assumes a level playing field, it assumes we hand out these credentials based on who's intelligent, who's not intelligent. That is not how it works. Right? It's completely imbalanced, completely unequal playing field. Yeah? <coughs> so what that does then is it just re-entrenches inequality. If you're working class, if you're from a poor background, you are less likely to have these qualifications. And now you have no complaint because you went through the same system everybody else did, the same system everybody else did. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this is what schooling has done. It's legitimized and entrenched inequality. So when we talk about inequality now, we start to say, well, what, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you got access to this? Yeah. The massification of university, as we'd like to call it, so is another example of this, right? So how, what percentage of the population do you think went to university in 1964? What percentage of the population do you think was university educated in 1964? Five percent. About five percent, four yeah. percent. What percentage of the population gets educated now in a university? It's close to 50, it's like 40, it's mid 40s. Yeah, it's mid 40 percent. So we're talking about a massive expansion of higher education. Again, if you listen to the rhetoric of this expansion, it is open education, open universities, up, everybody can get these credentials I'm talking about, and then when you have these credentials, you can go into better jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, what do we find now? Graduates like, still likely to be employed. Ethnic minority graduates extremely much more likely to be employed. It's terrible. That's just the statistics uh, for this university as well in particular show that as a Caribbean, black Caribbean, you're, or black African, or Asian, or actually any minority,
whatever, keep all working class. Show that your chances of getting a job are much, much, much less likely, <coughs> literally much less likely, half as likely in some cases as other minorities is the average. Yeah? So we have a system which says it's supposed to be equal, but actually it re-entrenches inequality. Actually, if you look at where the majority of working class and uh, black and minority students go, they go to universities that don't lead into jobs, or do courses that don't lead directly into jobs. Yeah? They're still an elite, and that elite is very, very well protected. So one of the principles that I often use to understand society is somebody called Derek Bell, who's a critical race theorist, he's dead now, but he wrote a book which is an excellent read and is in the library now, uh, called Faces at the Bottom of the Well. And what he says in his quote from there, and he says, he talks about the civil rights movement. He says, actually, if you look at the civil rights movement, nice in theory, in practice, it actually re-entrenched inequality. Right now, in practice, if you look at America now compared to America, then things are actually worse in many ways. Yeah, prison being a huge way in which it's worse, and violence being a huge way in which it's worse. Yeah. And so what his theory essentially is, uh, is that society, as it is fundamentally racist, when it tries to change to do things and it tries to be progressive, it actually ends up just recreating oppressive, the oppressive nature of the society. Yeah. So the quote I, I always use at any of these events is, uh, he says, what we deem as racial progress is actually a regeneration of the problem, but in a particularly perverse form. And it's a particularly perverse form because when we think you've dealt with the problem, but the problem is still there, where we can't deal with it anymore, right? So, for example, we're in this post-racial moment. We had the civil rights movement. We've had educational uh, action in, in Britain. Um, nobody even talks really that much about the educational inequalities in Britain anymore. This is a perfect example. So you have 50 years of educational activism around the idea of race, ethnicity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, specifically looking at African Caribbean boys. And actually, it's much more complicated than that. But if you just specifically look at African Caribbean boys. Had, there was a huge problem, money went into it, activism went into it, etc, etc, etc. Now we don't talk about it. And you would sh think because we don't talk about it, the problem's gone away. If you actually look at the stats, and look at the stats last week, it's still the same. It's, it's, it's terrible. There's a 10% gap in achievement uh, between uh, African Caribbean boys and everybody else. All right, and that 10% gap, it was a 10% gap 10 years ago, it was a 10% gap 20 years ago. It doesn't really get any better, right? It's particularly perverse, these changes, is because we stopped talking about them. Right now we talk about white, white working class boys, as if that wasn't always a problem as well. Yeah. So we have a school system which is fundamentally racist, fundamentally classist, um, fundamentally isn't about equality, but it's about entrenching inequality. And this is, that's kind of one of the main things, starting points uh, to get across. How does it do this? So the school system is based on a, one, a generally problematic idea. Yeah? If you look at the way schools are organized, it's about the talented 10th. How do we find the top? This it kind of assumes from the outset that there's 10% of people who are generally very good. There's a middle group of people who are all right, they're all right. And there's another five to 10% of people who are basically lost causes, violent, they, they need to get out of school, right? That's the principle on which our school system works, including university as well. Yeah. Would it surprise you to know that at GCSE and A-level, it is impossible, impossible, literally impossible for everybody to get an A. Is that a surprise? literally impossible. Everybody can't get an A at uni uh, um, GCSE and A-level. Why do you think that is? Why can't, why can't everybody get an A? What's the benchmark? Well, they have a foundation paper for one, so... Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, one, everybody's not, everybody's not even into, into a qualification where you can get an A, certainly. Yeah? But if everybody took the same qualification, it would be impossible for everybody to get an A. Do you know why that is? And why this is another thing, right? So we have a system of, a system of so for example, university level, in theory, everybody can get an A. In theory, everybody can get over 70%. It's, it's possible. There's a criteria. If you meet the criteria, in theory, you can get over 70%, right? Because it's, it's marked, the, the criteria, the standard, is what are we looking for in SA? Have you done it properly, et cetera, et cetera. GCSE A level is marked on what we call a bell curve, right? And a bell curve is basically, it's marked in relation to everybody else. They call it a bell curve because if you, if you plot everybody's um, results on a graph, you find there's some people who get really high at one end, some people who get really low at the other end, and in the middle, that's where you get everybody. So you get a peak, right? So it ends up being a bell curve, right? And this, how they work out the grades is in relation to each other, which means that there's a middle number, which could be say 50 or 60, and then they work out a certain percentage away from the middle, who's gonna get an A, who's gonna get a B, who's gonna get a C. Does that make sense? So one year, that means if the average one year is 50, the A will be set at, say, 60. If the average one year is 70, the A will be set at 80, right? 
So it's literally impossible. There's a principle that says there is a talented percentage of people. We're going to find those talented percentage of people, and we're going to give, the, and they're going to get the credentials, etc., etc., etc. Does that sound like a fair system? All right, it's a system which is set up on the principle that there's clever people, stupid people, and everybody else in the middle. And why we, been, why this is particularly problematic for black people, is because as you can imagine, in the image of what it is, what it is to be that intelligent person, we're not there. We don't figure it out. It's not impossible. Sorry, it's not impossible. Yeah, you can get there. But it's much, much, much more difficult. The way the school is set up, and schools, any research in the schooling will tell you this, schools kind of work on, they kind of identify, so you have the sets, you have the different people who do different papers. And what the teachers essentially are doing, they're, they're searching out and saying, who are these 10%? Who are, who are the brightest people? They get treated differently, they get more resources, et cetera, et cetera. And it's much, much more difficult for us, our children, to get into that 10%. And if you're not in that 10%, it's, a lot, it's much more difficult for you to go on, et cetera, et cetera. There's some, as a fundamental principle at the bottom of schooling, which is broken, when you layer that on in terms of race, ethnicity, you find it's really, really, really fundamentally broken. Yeah. There's a reason the, the achievement gap hasn't changed in 30, 40 years. There's a reason exclusion rates are very, very high for, for, for black, particularly black Caribbean students. Right? There's culturally, academically, the way that the school works, it works against our interests. So there's a quote from um, W.E.B. Du Bois who says, you cannot oh, what's the quote? Did they put it? Yes. A system cannot fail to protect cannot a system cannot fail those it was not meant to protect. See, we have had this idea that the school system is for us. It is not for us. It was never meant for us, right? It is meant to oppress us. That's the point of it, right? This is the, this is the, this is the, a lot of the time I talk I talk in kind of these radical to the left ideas on purpose to try and um, provoke discussion. On this issue, I'm saying it hundred percent. They are not for us, right? So what we have to learn to do is to navigate the schools differently and understand that relationship. It's not impossible, but it would be madness for me to say it's impossible for black children to come through the school system. I'm a black Caribbean male born in Birmingham. Yeah, I have a PhD. It's not impossible. It's certainly possible, all right? But that also, because there are people who have PhDs who are black Caribbean in Birmingham, doesn't mean we can say it's, it's possible for everybody. That is not how the system works, right? Not how the system works at all. All right, so marginalization, the system's not broken, it's something like says at all as well. The system isn't broken, the system is functioning. The fact that these things keep happening is not a mistake, it's how it's meant to be, it's how it's supposed to be. Right. One of the ways you can see this very, very, very clearly is in the curriculum. There's lots of other ways to look at it, which I could talk about another time, but particularly if you look at the curriculum in relation to black studies, the curriculum is Eurocentric. Now, not just the history curriculum is Eurocentric, the entire curriculum of schooling is Eurocentric. Geography, maths, science, it comes from a particular perspective, a particular point, right? Particular knowledge claims are validated within our curriculum and other knowledge claims are rejected. Yeah? We have a curriculum which is getting worse as well. It got a little bit better under new labor. When I say a little bit, I do mean a little bit. And now it's regressing even further back to classics, to Britishness, to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> but this isn't just about history. This is about every subject in the school. It teaches from a particular <coughs> perspective and it rejects other perspectives. Yeah? This is one of the reasons why black studies is important. So what do we need to do? We need to ex not have as much faith, or, well, I don't say no faith in the school system, but I have little faith in the school system. What the research I've done around Saturday schools shows is there are alternatives. Yeah? So Saturday schools, 50 year history, grassroots organizations, they started literally in people's front rooms where people just saying, you know what, my kid isn't getting education in that school system, I'm gonna do it myself. Yeah? Churches do them, organizations do them, just random people put together and do them. The first one was started in Birmingham by a group of young, young black men, actually, who said, enough is enough, let's do something differently. So we don't have to rely on the schools to do things. We can do things ourselves, and we have to do things ourselves, because we have to create different kinds of education, right? A critical education that can discuss some of these things, non-neurocentric education, um, different ways of teaching, for example. So Saturday schools is certainly one way, supplementary education, building our own things outside which can feed into the, feed into the mainstream will, will be different. Uh, black schools, I'm gonna give a talk in a couple of weeks on black independent schools and how those can work and how those can function. That's one of the, one of the solutions. There's also a way where you say, well, let's not be so negative about the mainstream schools. Maybe we can work in the mainstream schools. Maybe we can do certain things. But I firmly have the belief that this, the mainstream school system can't teach black studies effectively. It just can't do it. <laughs> you just can't, I would never, I would never want it to do it because the way it would do it would be in such a way that it would re-entrench inequality. Remember Derek Bell, what we deem as racial progress is a regeneration of the problem in a particularly perverse form. 
actually, when you look at how the national curriculum has tried to deal with this issue of Eurocentrism, the ways it does it kind of amaze to some extent. So for instance, there is a course you can do GCSE that looks at um, slavery. Will you be surprised to know it's not any slavery in the Caribbean, it's very American focused. Yeah? So slavery is not, it's not a British thing at all. No, it's an American thing, right? The actual understanding of slavery and how that is, is done is in that kind of tokenistic, probably makes things worse and it makes it better kind of way. Yeah? So there's a way within this, within, if we leave this to the school system to just do it, it will do it badly, it will probably make it worse. Yeah? If we say we want to engage with the school system and have these things in the school system, we should be saying, look, this is how you do it. This is the, this is the curriculum we have created. We will come into the schools and teach it and you can pay us to do it. But we cannot ever rely on the school system to do it because I guarantee the way the school system will do it will just be a regeneration of the problem in a particularly perverse form. Yeah. And when we look, I'm gonna go off on a little bit of a tangent, but anybody seen any these, this rash of slavery movies that have come out recently? Like, it's just always, oh, literally you never had any. For, for a certain amount of time, there's no movies about slavery. It's like one, Amistad, that was about it. Then events happen which make it more palatable, right? So there was the abolition of the British Slave Trade Act, 200 year celebration. Do you know how long ago that was? It was 2007. It's what, 2014? That's, there's still a good 20 years since between the, in between the gap of when the slave trade was ended and the actual slavery was ended. I'm not sure what exactly we were celebrating in, um, in 2007, but it's a big celebration. Then you have that ridiculous film, Amazing Grace, about Wilberforce, the savior of slavery, the slavery of the slaves. Now you have, in recently, in recent years, a quick number of them have come up. So there's um, that LinkedIn had it in there, LinkedIn again, the, the savior, uh, 12 years a slave. And um, there's a new one in Britain, Bell. And Bell's the worst of all of them. Jeez, Bell just like makes things up. There's a, a film called Bell, which is about uh, a British <laughs> woman <laughs> who was enslaved. That's where it actually just makes, just takes history and completely distorts it and makes it up. Like, it just makes a completely different idea of history. Yeah? And from looking at these movies and how they put things across and how they portray things, there's particular things you can see which are most. So there's a white savior narrative. There's all oh, black <coughs> people are probably some, somewhere to blame as well. Uh, there's no connection between the events of slavery and the other much broader events around the same time, there's nothing at all about rebellion. Rebellion, that never happened, right? Mm -hmm. So, I went off on a tangent, what did I say? The point of this was to say, this is the kind of history we would get if the school system, we live, if we leave it to the school system to do. It was something around those ideas which we don't want, right? So if we're gonna say, let's have a bit more faith in the schools, I have no faith in the schools, if we're gonna have a little bit more faith in the schools, we should be doing it ourselves. Saying this is how it's done, we will come and do it. And that can potentially work. But what we have to do is create alternative spaces for education, because within the school system, it's not to say it can't happen 100%, because there are places it can happen, but you just can't expect it to happen or not. Schools are institutions the same way that prisons are institutions. So we should start thinking about prisons the same way, schools the same way we think about <coughs> prisons, and that'll get us a bit further in our thinking. Yeah. We have to be radical in the way that we do things and creating new forms of knowledge. So, this is where it comes to um, black studies. As black studies, what we're trying to do is say there's different ways you can understand things there's a different knowledge bases which you can draw from and if we create new knowledge bases maybe we can create new realities of things yeah. and they're not even new particularly right so for example uh, a lot of my work is around black independent institutions or ed education the magazine you've got there is organization of black unity which is set up on malcolm x's uh, organization african-american unity same principles exactly the same we just said look it was it was good enough in 1964 the problems are the same now so we'll set it up in 2014. These aren't new ideas. These ideas have been around for a long, long, long time. What you find, though, is that these ideas aren't given any legitimacy, right? So there's nobody in academia writing about the politics and the realities of black schools. What does that mean? You don't find that. You find little bits and places, but you don't find it in the big spot. Yeah. You won't find that Pan-African radical tradition nowadays, anyway. In the past, you would find it. Nowadays, you don't find it, right? So there's knowledge forms which exist. There's people who have, for so example, um, Malcolm X, you all know who Malcolm X is, right? Yeah, because I know sometimes I don't, even know, I don't know who Malcolm X is. So Malcolm X for me is the theoretical basis for most of the work which I talk about. And as an academic and as a sociologist, that's a bit heretical, right? It's not Marx, it's not some dead white man who's, who I'm taking my ideas from. It, it literally is Malcolm X. So this is what Malcolm X said, that sounds about right. Let's build a politics and a theory around that. And that's a different thing to do. Yeah? And so this is what I was trying to say with black studies. There's knowledge out there, there's history out there, there's, a, there's a things you can capture out there, we just need to give it 
that legitimacy, that knowledge base, and then build on from there. So this is the kind of thing I'm talking about in black studies. Uh, to clarify, black studies, I don't, um, black studies include black history, but it is not black history, if that makes sense. So history is important, history is extremely important, telling a proper accounting of history is important, but black studies is much more than history. I don't really do history um, other than, you know, so for example, the Saturday School book isn't about, it's not the history of Saturday School so much, it's more about the, the politics of the Saturday Schools, what are, how do Saturday Schools work, how do they work nowadays? So I'm a sociologist, and you can have black studies who are geog geog do geography or philosophy or science, right? So it isn't just about history. That's an important thing to say for history, because one of the things that we have done, if you look at the education movement, and even the Saturday School movement in Britain, is we've kind of taken the approach um, that history is really important, history is important, but history is important for psychological reasons, right? So if you look at a lot of the narratives, a lot of the ideas, a lot of the arguments, the argument being made is that black children don't relate to schools because they have a low self-esteem because they can't see themselves in history. Now, that might be true. I don't, I don't doubt it's not true. Right? But for me, it's more complicated than that. Because when you start to go down those roads of saying it's about self-image, self-esteem, you actually start to locate the problem within black children. Right? You actually say, well, this is a psychological problem. If you can give black children the correct historical understanding, they will elevate themselves, and then they will do well, move on for society, etc., etc., etc. For me, that's far too psychological. Far too locates the problem with the children. These problems are, they are, these problems manifest themselves in psychology. There's a reason why you're 18 times more likely to be uh, mentally ill if you're black in Britain, right? Living in a racist society is going to make you a bit crazy, yeah? <laughs> no, no, I mean that in a serious, no, it's a bit of a joke, but I mean that's generally seriously mean that, right? So there are psychological manifestations, but these are, the solutions to our problems are not psychological, right? So fixing the psychology of black people or black children isn't going to change the reality that we live in a structurally racist society, which needs change. So when we talk about black studies and the importance of the curriculum, we're saying actually the whole entire curriculum fundamentally is Eurocentric. The whole entire curriculum fundamentally privileges some knowledge and dashes away other knowledge. And so what we have to do is to build a different curriculum, a different kind of education. And this is where we say black studies. And black studies cuts across the entire curriculum. Because there are other ways to think about things. There are other ways to do things, right? There are other economic models around <laughs> things. African socialism, for instance, is something that doesn't really get talked about anymore. African environmentalism, right? There's lots of different ways to do things. This is what, so it's not just history, it is also um, a much broader approach. So how do we define black studies? In the association, there are two things we use to define black studies. One relates to the African diaspora. Simply that, it's about black people. That's the simple way to put it, yeah? Secondly though, and this is probably more important than the first part, is it's not just about black people, it's about how do we improve the lives and conditions which black people live in and face in the UK, in the Caribbean, in globally, anywhere. Yeah? Because we can't just have an academic experience which says, well, what are the problems? How do we, can we, can we get some black people and talk to them and then do some interviews and then write about it? That can't be what we are doing when we're doing black studies. That is one of the fundamental problems with the way that our Eurocentric system works, is it separates out knowledge and action. Right? So if you look at the way university works, yeah? the idea of the university is it's a cerebral intellectual thing. And that is totally separate from the practical reality that happens on the day-to-day. The, -day. the ivory tower of universities. That needs to change. That needs to stop immediately, right? Knowledge and action have to be together. They have to be connected, they have to be combined. Yeah. That's a fundamental principle of black studies. That we have, to, we, have to do, we have to be doing work which is improving the world. That sounds a bit corny, actually, when I put it like that. Right? But doing work, doing work is, is directly engaged with people's experiences and people's lives. Yeah? And that sounds quite simple, but actually, especially working in university, it's much more complex. It's much, it's much, the idea that you wouldn't do that is very, 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 very entrenched. So when we do it in terms of methodologies, this, this is why the knowledge is important, because in terms of methodologies, in terms of literature, in terms of how you do things, that gets transformed when you take on a different mindset, right? You just have to do different things, have to do different ways of understanding. Also important for this, and this is, this is, an issue, this is something which people raise a lot, is blackness. See, black for me is very, 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 very important. I use it on purpose, use it positively, use it politically, but not Use it politically, but not in the idea of political blackness. Political blackness being the idea that everybody who's not white is black. That needs to go in the bin straight away, right? When I say black, I mean African descent, African diaspora. I can go on for loads and loads and loads of time about that, but I won't. The important thing to say is that this idea of blackness, for me, is absolutely central to what I mean by black studies. See, the criticism of this is why not say African? Why not say African? Yeah, that's a criticism. This criticism of all the time. I have, to, I have to deal with this a lot of the time. There is a reason for it, yeah? Firstly, blackness in this sense I'm talking about is automatically connected to African. 
Right. When we say black, when I say black anyway, and when people in the, in the organization say black, we mean African. There's an automatic connection to that, right? Very, very firmly rooted in African principles and African history, African tra trajectory. Very, very important. This African scholar, African scholarship is hugely important to what we're talking about. Right? But there is a, and I don't have any problem with, with African at all, actually. But what can happen and has happened a lot of the time with the embrace of Africans is what uh, is called, what we call cultural nationalism. Cultural nationalism being the idea that it is going back to African tradition, African culture, which is the solution to our problems. And actually, if you look in American academia, see, American black starts as black studies, ends up as African American studies, Africana studies. What it becomes is a discussion about, you know, who can wear the best, who can wear the, the nicest dashiki, right? Who's, who's the African drummer? Yeah. Well, if, this is cultural, if we have this cultural connection, and I'm not even saying the cultural connection is a bad thing, right? The cultural connection is important. But the important thing I'm saying here is the cultural connection is not an answer to our problems. The same way the psychological problem isn't an answer to our problems either. Yeah. Culture is crucial to revolution, but culture is not revolution. Yeah. And this is this, this is this debate between uh, what they called at the time it was black nationalism versus cultural nationalism. It goes all the way back to the 60s, 70s Panthers versus some of these cultural national organizations. Yeah. It's really an important debate to, to, to grasp. Because what's happened here, particularly in terms of black radicalism nowadays, is you do have this very strong African cultural nationalism. If we can only think African, then we will be in a better place. We can think African all we like. Ain't changing the conditions that we live in today, right? So that's why I use blackness in purpose, on purpose, right? Because that blackness connects us when we understand it properly to a radical politics that goes back through Malcolm X, through the Panthers, that goes back to Marcus Garvey, that goes back to Paul Bogle, that goes back through um, Harriet Tubman, that goes back through. In fact, a nice time for a plug. The organisation of Black Unity has put together a booklet, which is called "The Power of the Movement." Uh, Pioneers of the fight for black liberation. So there's 17 people in here of um, liberation struggle, so that, that come acro cut across Africa, the Caribbean, South America. And this is the kind of thing we say with black studies, right? It's a small booklet, easy for kids to read, some other information you can, you can pick up from there. Only costs two pounds if anybody wants to buy one, I have, I have a limited availability of them here. But there's a tradition and a trajectory that, if you, that someone like this captures of blackness, of, rad of black radical politics of the politics we are purposely trying to connect into because where we've gone seriously wrong over the last 20 years, down a culturally nationalist route rather than a political route, if that makes sense. Anyway, so blackness is really important for, for that reason. So, black studies. Ain't been from the ground up, politics, sociology, um, all of the different um, disciplines. The important thing is a knowledge base. It's to put together a different kind of knowledge base. And we are doing this association, people can join it soon actually, uh, where we're trying to bring together academics, practitioners, members of the community, and say that actually we need to have a foothold of different knowledge. And that is one of the ways, not the only way in any ways, shape or form, one of the ways we can make things better. How does it help? And this is the third thing I said I was talking about. How, how does it help? What does that mean? Right? So let's say you have this black studies, it's legitimately acknowledged, it's embedded within university, et cetera. So why can it help, right? One of the ways it can help, um, particularly around schools, is to create different curricula, right? So one of the things we're definitely, both the organization of Black Unity and the Black Studies Association is committed to is creating a different curriculum for schools. Is saying actually we can do things differently. This, this is how we are going to do this. Yeah? This is how it is going to work. That can mean black independent schools. That can mean Saturday schools, supplementary schools, other kinds of projects. Uh, that can mean working with the schools, but fundamentally say we have to create something different because what we have at the minute can't possibly work for our children. I, wanna, I can't stress that enough. It can't, it's not just that it doesn't work, it's that it can't work. One of the ways that black studies can help is it can connect uh, young, young people in particular into the school system. So if you look at why, one of the main reasons why people don't, and particularly black children, but not just black children, working class children, lots of children, don't succeed is because they're they marginalized from the curriculum, from the schools, right? There is nothing that keeps them connected into it. Yeah? Distance from it from the very, very start, from the very, very, very outset of it. And because of that, they, they reject it, they stay away from it. That, partly that's the curriculum, yeah? Partly that's what you have to do, the curriculum, how it's organized, how the schools are put together. Partly it's the teachers, how the teachers expect things, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? There's lots of things which marginalize young people. So I've, if I'm looking back and saying, well, look, I have a PhD, I went to an inner city school in Birmingham, what's the difference between the other black Caribbean boys who went to the school? Lots of things are different, right? Lots, lots of loads and loads and loads of things are different. 
right? I had um, a better understanding early how to navigate this stuff. I had to understand it's a game, you have to play it. Yeah? Um, wasn't as directly marginalized from things. But you can see this very, very early on how people just get marginalized from it, get kicked out from it, yeah? and then reject it. It's not a people, it's nothing to do with intelligence or talent at all. Right? It's simply <coughs> about understanding how to navigate through that system and not understanding how to navigate through that system. Being marginalized versus not being as marginalized. Right? These things are really, really important. I was fortunate enough to be identified early on as in that 10%. It's not impossible for black men. And you find that a lot of times. People say, yeah, I was in that 10%. When you're in that 10%, black, white, age, it doesn't matter what color you are. If you're in that 10%, you're going to get better treatment. If you're not in that 10%, you're going to get worse treatment. If you're a black, young male, you're more likely going to be in the bottom 5% in how you're treated from the very start. This isn't like 16, 17. This is 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yeah. So there's something about schools which do that. So a different kind of knowledge, different kind of understanding can challenge that, uh, can change that. Start with people's experience, all right? Things which are interesting to people, I think are going to make them more engaged with things. But not just historical, also in reality. What we're saying about black studies, it has to be connected to the reality. If I was organizing a school and had a curriculum, we would do things in our local community. Yeah? Write a letter to your MP because of some of the problems you've seen in the prisons or in, in, in the, with the police. Yeah? Why isn't this kind of things within the curriculum? Why is it all theory, et cetera, et cetera? Because we separate it out. Theory, intellectual, not practice. We need to forget for that and make it much more collective. There's ways to do education which directly engage students in their lives and in their ways of doing things, and also teach them how to read, write, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Also, one of the problematic things with our school system is the student-teacher relationship. It's built on a very, very student. Teacher has all the power, student has no power. This is why this idea of who gets as the 10% is important, because once you're in that 10%, the teacher's power is diverted to you. Once you're not in that 10%, the teacher has a lot of power to, to, to get rid of you, essentially. Okay. That needs to change. Right? We need to stop seeing children as being passive, who just accept things, and actually start to see children as co-constructing knowledge. There are certain things within universities which are, aren't that great, but there are certain things which are quite good as well. And one of those things is that the relationship is different. Yeah. There's no need to be a demon towards the children. Right? And actually, looking at black educational <laughs> movements, we can oftentimes be much, much worse than white people with that idea of what, what does it mean to be a good educator. Yeah. Actually, the, with one of the arguments on the more conservative side of, of the black experience is to say the kids aren't getting beaten enough, right? We all heard it, right? The kids aren't, there's not enough discipline in the schools, we need more discipline. In fact, 2008, and I'm going to end on this story probably, yeah, 2008, uh, David Cameron came to New Star Radio. You know New Star Radio, Dudley Road? Um, on a black radio, conservative, he was running, running to be um, Prime Minister at the time. I would like to think about 20 years ago, he'd have got a night, he'd have got a grilling. I don't think he'd have been invited, but if he was invited, there'd have been, a, there'd have been loads of things by then. Whole of this show, and I kid you not, was the DJ asking the question, uh, "When are we going to bring back the cane in schools? If you get into if you get into Prime Minister, are you going to bring back the cane?" And the whole entire show was about discipline in schools. How we need to be more disciplined with to our children. This is this is the madness which has become with the black community. We've given up on these on, on proper radical, not even radical, just just logical discussions about how you're going to change the education system and make things more fair and just gone down this route where we look very much about individuals, about culture, about parenting, about families. Look, these things are issues, but there's issues which are created by the system and they cannot be changed without changing the system. It's simple as that. So that's how we get to the point where New Star Radio, black radio show, we have pro-conservative questions for, um, for the conservative candidate for the election. So we've come to a point where we need something new, we need something fresh, because and it does involve, in a sense, going back and trying to bring back some of the things which we had before because you've lost them and kind of diverted like course. So that's another reason why we're doing black studies, to try and bring this stuff together again and present a different front, a different way of doing things. Yeah, so that's really all I wanted to say, just to say that we need black studies, new forms of knowledge, really, really important. We also need a broader idea of the education system. Schools aren't the only thing which educate our children, right? There's other ways to educate our children and we need to engage them much, much more. We need to educate our children ourselves. And essentially, we need to have education for liberation and understand that we are still oppressed within this society. That hasn't changed over the last 50, 60, 70, 80, 400 years, right? We are still an oppressed minority within society and we still need to liberate ourselves from this society. And that is a different way of mindset of thinking about it. Thank you.
a lot of critique and, and process. And so it, it gives the opportunity to either challenge him, disagree with him, present a new um, paradigm of thought, and, and, and let's, let's, let's hear what he has to say. Um, and perhaps I can get, um, get the ball rolling. Spoke about the ten percent differential, right, between Black Caribbean males and their, I presume, white counterparts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, could you drill deeper into that and help us to understand why that 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 gap persists? Um, one would have assumed that by now, in the twenty first century, with everything that's going on, access to education, et cetera, et cetera, that gap might have shrunk. And it hasn't. Could you help us understand that a little bit more? Well, yeah, I say it's, it's the structural problems with the system, right? Particularly around about who gets. If you think about one of the central things about who who is identified as intelligent, not intelligent, who's identified as dangerous, unintelligent. There is a cultural, structural thing within the schools which makes it much, much more difficult for Black children, and most particularly Black Caribbean children, uh, essentially come into schools labelled at the bottom. And you, if you prove you're not in the bottom, then you can get to the middle and you can get to the top essentially, right? But the starting point from your teacher expectations with the way this works, is you're at the bottom, right? And this culture is really important because of well, how that rejects, um, how that rejects black, black children in particular, right? There's a graph, which I'll, I always mean to bring in, but I've stopped doing PowerPoints now, so they just drive me mad, uh, that shows that when black children come into the school system, we, we, now they do these um, assessments at every level, generally doing better than most other children, or around about the top. Yeah? And every single year that black children stay in the school system, it gets worse and worse and worse. Literally, school is bad for black people. Literally, it's actually bad. The evidence suggests that school is bad for black people. Because the further you get through, the, and then you come to the end, you're at, and you're actually at the bottom, <coughs> and you start at the top. Yeah? And why is this? Um, because of the structural problems, but also because of the way that we have dealt as a community with these issues is, I would say, we've gone the wrong way about it. We've still had too much faith in the schools, right? We said, how do we engage the schools to do this? How can we make the schools, uh, what can the schools do which is going to change this? And we've put loads and loads of faith in the schools. We haven't put as much faith in things like Saturday schools. So they're very, very underfunded, unsupported by the community, almost disappeared um, from their heyday. Uh, if you compare the progress of the last 20 years, however, to Pakistani Bangladeshi, who were around about as bad doing as badly as African Caribbean boys, they're now average. And the reason for their being average, I would say now, is Muslim schools. There is a proliferation of Muslim schools, right? The loads of these Muslim schools are different, and what's, this is important because there's a different way to do things, right? There's a different way to teach. There's a different way to engage. And all the evidence says that Muslim kids go to Muslim schools, they do a lot better than Muslim kids that don't go to Muslim schools. But we've taken the approach to support the mainstream schools and not to support our own stuff, and that's the problem. Can, can I also ask this? We're in an area of white privilege, so the criminal justice system takes care If you see the decline <coughs> in education, you see the growth in incarceration. It just goes like this. So the reality of it is, white privilege and the maintenance through colorblind approaches creates what we call identity politics. It's not about racism, it's about white privilege and the maintenance of it. So that's why we're in an area of mass incarceration. And the way that you get black people to be docile is give them TV, hip hop, Give them all the stuff. And so what we're doing is replicating the very same structure to keep us down. And it's no different to the food. People will sell us back our food. So the reality of it is, if me and Katie were talking, we'd have the same conversation, because the people that you lose, they come to me. There's a commonality. <laughs> but what happens is, but academics, white academics, <coughs> operate in silos. And sociologists look to this, uh, criminologists look to this. If you look at it holistically, which is what we have to do, what you realize is there's a, nobody looks at the holistic framing. So what I'm dealing with is, we haven't got, Malcolm X said it, you haven't got a tap in the old town until you deal with the structural concerns. And one of the exercises we did in prison is in prison, they have books on the Russian Revolution, the French Revolution, the Cuban Revolution. The moment you say black nationalism, everybody frets, but we've got Scottish nationalism with the referendum, Welsh nationalism, so black people not have no right to self-determination unless you're selling drugs or you're singing or whatever. So what I'm saying is, the reason it's never gonna change because we've expanded 
the prison industrial estate to accommodate who you lose. So if you look at who's in prison, it's exactly the same use to come at the bell curve at the tail end. But we're not educating students to be critical thinkers at the degree level. So, so what we have is people that don't think. Because everything that they're taught at university, as, as Kahigi was saying, simply this. Black studies is not just about what you learn, it's how do you condition your mind to operate in the conditions that you live. And unfortunately, we wrote, created everything before anybody else, but you wouldn't know that. So white privilege says to black people, you can do what you want, providing that we set the decisions. Because we don't have the resources to control education. So what I'm saying is, that's why it's never gonna change. So I just wanted to, sorry about that, I just wanted to throw it in. institutional racism in the education system? First question, and what's linked to that? How do children now navigate through the education system while we are educating each other? Hmm? Yeah, well. Yeah, uh, just to recapitulate, does everybody get the question, but first of all, okay. Um, yeah, of course, of course there's institutional racism, uh, institutional racism in, in the school system. And I would say we have, to, we have to start thinking of schools like prisons. And as Martin was perfectly saying, there is a school to prison pipeline, um, which you can see very clearly in the United States is very, very obvious, right? In the United States, if you basically look at America, it's Britain where everything's a lot worse, so you can see the relations a lot better, a lot clearer, yeah? And this is the same problem that we have here, right? There is literally a pipeline from schools through to people referral units, typically through to prisons. Yeah? So the institutional racism in, in schools is just as bad and just as perverse, and actually starts that institutional racism in, in, in prisons and is linked into the police force. My most another good point uh, I forgot to mention about black studies is it's interdisciplinary. Yeah? You can't look at these things at one, one, one. You have to look at it much more. So when you're doing sociology, you're doing history, you're doing geography, you're doing social policy, you're doing all of this, you're doing criminology, yeah? because it's all these things are all connected. So in school, there's much. Of, <laughs> there's loads of evidence I've got to go and give you about the institutional racism within within schools. It is about the curriculum. It is about what we call cultural capital within schools, right? So how is it? Um, and it's things that don't, that might not seem important, but actually are really, really important. So for example, hairstyle. Yeah? Can you send your kid to a school with a line in his hair now? Is that okay? Is that acceptable? It wasn't acceptable when, when I was in school, it became a little bit acceptable, now again, I think it's gone back. There's a uniform, uniformity around how you do things. It's not coincidental, this uniformity tends to attack black cultural expression. Yeah? That's one of the ways kids get rejected straight away. You don't talk properly, you don't dress properly, you don't have the right kind of hair. So it seems kind of benign at the, at the outset of it, but that is really important, right? Because the culture that they want, how you're expected to behave within the school system is based on white middle class behavior, right? So obviously the advantage of white middle class because that's how you behave, right? And if you don't, if you're further you are away from that norm, the more and more inequality you're going to face within the school system. Right? Same question you asked was about... How do students navigate? Yeah. And this is actually something we're writing up now about the um, Saturday school movement. So actually one of the things why it was so, it is, was, it is so important, why it works, is what it does, what a lot of the time spent within a Saturday school is doing, is, is trying to tell kids how do you survive the system, right? It's saying, look, the system is racist, the system is not for you, but you can navigate if you do these things. Yeah? So it isn't, it's not like it's impossible to get through the system, you just have to know how to get through the system. And that is one of the, that is one of the strategies we can use in order to get people these, quali these qualifications, right? How do you navigate? How do you deal with the teacher when teacher like it? How do you make, actually, how do you learn stuff outside of school, right? This is, this is the, I was in school for what? Since I was five to university, I was like 20, 20 I don't know, long time, 20, 20 years probably, right? 20 years in school. And actually, the stuff that I know the most about, nobody ever taught me about, right? The actual content of my school was basically useless, right? They taught me to read and write, outside of that, well, I haven't got anything. Yeah? So actually, most of the learning that we have to do is outside of the school. And that's something we have to get as well. You can't trust the schools to deal with the kids. Yeah, if you do that, it's, all, it's literally over. 
right? And that's one of the problems that the community has got. Kind of say, well, school should work. Let's make work schools work better and leave it to the school to deal with our kids. That's that's <laughs> that's not going to get us anywhere, kids. Yeah. So what, what's an alternative resource for you to do research on a side school? Because if, if I decide not to go to university and stay and do my research, whatever research I'm doing was thrown off from the school. So how do I relate that together? What do you mean? Like if I decide not to go to school yeah. and I want to do my research by myself to study or to just to kind of like define my life myself, mm. whatever resources I'm going to use to do that was brought from the school. From so the how would I? How do, you, how do you explain the formal yeah. structures of education to actually? Yeah, do so you can't like? Right. Oh right, yeah, so we clarify this. This is, this is a kind of anti-school <coughs> idea, right? But all the saying the schools are necessary. Yeah. Now again, it would be totally hypocritical of me to stand yes. here and say, well, you know, don't <laughs> go to school, right? The professor. <laughs> <himself. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's gone through all the levels of school, so I can't make an argument. That's not what I'm saying actually. What I'm saying is we have to understand. We have to understand how it works. How does it work? It's worse on a system of credentials. Unless, and I'm not even against this idea, we are going to do Garvey, pick up and move to Africa and start a new society. Until that happens, right, we are here. And while we're here, we have to play the game. And playing the game means getting the credentials. So this, is, this, is, this isn't a don't go to school argument at all. This is an argument saying, yes, you have to understand, you have to do these things, you have to tick these boxes, because that's really important to get resources. But that's not enough. But that isn't, that's not enough at all. And actually, to get though, and not, and not even just that it's not enough, but in order to be to be successful in getting those ticking those boxes, you have to educate yourself and be more. What, why is it, for example, that I got through the schools and some of the, my friends didn't get through the schools? Right? It was the other stuff in that I was doing personally, reading, education, the other stuff I was involved with. That's what sustained me through it. And you, in doing that, you get skills which take you through 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 the major system as well, right? So I'm saying if you have students who are connected, to, if we can get students connected in other stuff which they're interested in, get them to navigate through the system. Then you have the best of both worlds. You still have the credentials, but you have other stuff as well, and you can create different knowledge streams. And also, why the black study stuff is important, particularly from a university level, uh, if you like, is to give legitimacy to doing other kinds of things, right? So I don't think it's, oh, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be necessary. You have to educate yourself outside of school and then go to school and do that stuff. But if we can produce a platform of black studies that says actually there's a different way of doing curriculum, there's a different kind of school, we can have our own school, black independent education that does, it, that does all these things within the same school, then, that, then you can kind of close the gap a little bit and say, yeah, you can get through the system with this different model of school. And that's what we're trying to do with me. So I, I've got a follow-up question to that. How do you think so, one's social circumstance affects, you know, I mean, using your, your own <coughs> comparison, use your peers, why did you succeed and why others didn't? How does, how does one social circumstance alter that reality? Yeah, that's another part of the story, right? So class within race, there are class dimensions. Yeah. Another reason I'm saying, why did I succeed, other people didn't succeed? I didn't have the same, um, I wasn't from the same level of poverty. And that's hugely important, right? Hugely important around resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we have to understand that these are the conditions, and then we have to say, well, how do we address them? So how do we bring in more resources? And the perverse thing that we tend to find generally across the system, not just for black people, but generally, is that middle class families have more resources and working class poorer families have less resources. Well, let's try and flip that around. Let's try and put more, more of our resources into communities where they don't have those resources. Yes, ma'am. Okay, like you talk about black students, should that be taught independently as a course on its own within the education system, or should it be aligned with history, geography, maths, uh, science? How would it actually be included in the education? Um, why, 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 why should it be included with other things? I, I don't know what the, I'm asking you what, what do you think? I, I think it should be <laughs> included. So when we're having a history lesson on Project Nightingale, it should also be encouraged and talk about like Mary Sweetheart, science, when we're talking about Isaac Newton, we should also talk about how you're uh, employed. But I, I, what I'm looking at is the whole thing of black studies. Who's going to create that curriculum? Who's going to create that course? Yeah, all right, so ideally, if we say like, I said, we are building the idea of having a, a black school with a different kind of curriculum, but it is still in, engaged with the mainstream curriculum because you have to, but those things are a bit different. If you have a school like that, you don't need a black study school. <coughs> not necessary because black studies is embedded across. Yeah? However, that's not the reality anywhere other than this imaginary black school, right? So because of that, you have to have it as a distinct thing, right? And particularly if you're looking at mainstream school systems, they are not going to change to incorporate black studies across the thing, right? So we have to say there is this 
thing with black study this is what it looks like this is the key things in it and this is how you teach it who would design it it's the people who can design so I, i'd be involved other people be involved teachers be involved you get people together and say well, what is it that we need how do we do it how do we design it and you package it together and so what we would like to see is from literally from from nursery level and actually look at the back of the um, magazine we've got organization of black unity we're trying to restart the Marcus Garvey nursery. We're saying from nursery level, school level, university level, what is black study? What is the curriculum? How does it work? What are the resources? How do you teach it? And then once you've got that, um, as a separate subject, it has to be a separate subject within somewhere like here or within the mainstream school. But if you have your own school, yeah, I agree. It doesn't have to be a separate subject. It can be embedded. Sorry, I just wanted to come back to the question. In medical practice, a heart specialist still operates on the body, but they're a heart specialist. Mm -hmm. In black studies, No, the actual research, this is the, the black uh, boy girl distinction uh, is overplayed. So, African Caribbean girls do better than African Caribbean boys, right? In relation to all girls, African Caribbean girls are still subject to, it's not, it's not quite as large a gap, but it's still a gap. So, if you add up all that, if you had to look at all girls compared to girls, African Caribbean girls, I don't want to use the word underachieve because it's a, not quite how I want to put it, but don't quite achieve at the same level as girls. And that's kind of been missed in a lot of this discussion. It's not just about boys. African Caribbean girls have the same yeah. problem. It's just not quite as magnified. It's not, so they're not if, you, if you compare them to the boys, it's not quite as bad. But that problem is still, it's still very, very much there as well for the Caribbean girls. And it's also, and actually interestingly, if you look at the stats, African is changing a bit as well. Right? So African typically, when I was going to school, model minority, did better, relatively the same as Chinese and Indian who do very, very well. That's not the case anymore. It's kind of come down. It's kind of actually, if you look at over the years, it's kind of dragged down towards um, Caribbean, if you like. And partly the explanation I would give for that is the generally the differences between African and Caribbean have become less as well. So when you have people whose parents are born in um, Africa, people parents are born in the Caribbean, you have this distinction culturally, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When you have people who's black and born in Britain, you tend to see those differences dissipate a little bit. Yeah. So it's, so that kind of African Caribbean thing is not a big, not as big a deal as it was when we, when we were younger. And in 20 years, it won't be a big deal at all. Right. So the, the problem is England, though. Yeah. <laughs> 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 How far have we gone with the food cycles in, in Canada, in Australia, Canada, and, and, and actually acting on this so that we can actually incorporate that in the education sector? Have we actually put it anywhere, or is it a big deal? 
Interesting question, right? How do I, how do I answer this? Right, okay, so I'm going to preface this by saying that um, when we talk about black studies, right, I come from a particularly radical, I'm talking, I often drop in these radical things on purpose, and that's kind of my perspective on this stuff, yeah? But there's, there's also a trajectory, right? So everybody within black studies doesn't have to be that kind of radical Ma Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey revolution stuff, right? There's a more kind of less radical end to this, yeah? Um, why I say this, because if you ask me that question about uh, parliament, that's not, I'm not really interested, right? The question is, what have we done ourselves to build this as a reality, right? So we can go to parliament and say, we need this, we need this, we need this. We need what? What do we need? We don't have anything, we don't have anything to say we need. Yeah? We haven't done the work to build something credible to say this is what we need. Before we go to parliament and say yeah, this is the case we need to make, we actually need to make it, right? We haven't built anything, we don't have anything. This is at the minute, li not largely, 100% theory, right? Or based on the bits and pieces you can, s so the work I did in the Saturday School Movement, actually what I was doing was looking saying, can you see black radicalism in, in the community? Can you see this kind of emergent critical education? What I found was no, you can't see it. Actually, what you see in the Saturday School Movement is largely uh, just a reflection of the mainstream schools. There's the deep conservatism in terms of what, what does it mean to have education? Why do we do certain things? There's generally tends to be very strong. The teacher-student relationship is oftentimes worse than it is in the uh, mainstream schools. So actually, when you start to look at some of the educational movements that we've done, we haven't built this case at all. It doesn't exist. Yeah? And so that's the first, for, for me, that's the first step. We have to build it. We have to legitimate it. We have to make it exist. We have to also then accept that maybe, to some extent, you say that maybe, maybe the, the politicians aren't going to accept it, right? We do it anyway. Yeah? Education doesn't just happen in schools. Education happens outside of schools. So you can do things, you can still do it, even if the government don't, aren't interested. So from my, my perspective, personally, I'm not that interested in what the government says. It's about what we do. But there's other people who would be more kind of sense, yeah, we need to, we need to engage with the mainstream politicians. Well, would that be an example of learning helplessness just as we are depending on the schools to give us something, we uh, looking for the parliament to give us something, whereas re reversing the, 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 the cycle, um, like you said, we go out and create it. Um, um, black, uh, looking at the, uh, from the American perspective, black progress wasn't dependent on Congress, black pro <coughs> progress was dependent on community. Mm -hmm. And so how do we mobilize ourselves to, to create the change that we seek for ourselves without depending on, on yeah. whoever to give it to us. I can attend to a lot of people that agree with the government and the people. You don't know how to speak. I get, a lot of, I get attend to a lot of people that agree with the people, but they just don't know how, especially on the university level. You know, I mean, I think we, we would be the best thing to, to keep pushing it forward. And there's not enough people that know a direction to go in. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah, to, yeah, to, to make the links and so forth. I'll come with this one first. Yeah. Mass, and I suppose when, when we compare the UK situation with the US, I mean, no one can diss Martin Luther King and all those things that have happened, but clearly in the States, it's about critical mass. You've got the numbers there. When you look at the black population here, it, it doesn't have a figure. You know, in terms of, and, and in that respect, you know, we haven't got the economic power, we don't control the media, but we do have to recognise what power we do have. Mm. Look at what we have in common. Um, yeah, all right, there's two things I want to pick up. Uh, organization, one second, but I'll come to this thing first, right? One of the, yeah, one of the problems that we have generally is, and this is where I guess the more radical side of me comes in a little bit here, is, right? When we're analyzing things, we tend to look at things nationally. 
This is a national problem. Racism is a global problem. Yeah. It's a global problem which connects into the Caribbean, Americas, etc. And actually, if you look at things on a global level, then you start to see, well, actually, we have less in common with people who live next door to us than we have with people who live in the Caribbean, who live in Africa, who live in America. Actually, the city, if you look at America as a good example, not the only example, the things that we as black people face in the school system here are identical to the things that black people face in the school system in America. They are not identical to the things that Pakistani, Indian, Chinese people in Birmingham face. Right? They are different problems. And this is the problem when we say our first point of call is to, is to get everybody on board. We have different issues and different problems. And when we do that, we can't deal with the issues. Now, I do not say that we shouldn't have links and connections with other movements. Of course we should. There's things we have in common. There are things we don't have in common. And as a community, our main problem is that we haven't dealt with our own stuff. Never, don't, never dealt with it. We've always been too quick to say, well, let's, let's work with the government. Let's work with everybody else. What about the stuff that impacts us? We don't have as many people here as there are in America. But there's a lot of us. There's, there's, not, there's, there's, a, there's, a, oh, there's a couple of million of us. You know what I'm saying? There's enough of us in the city of Birmingham to do something serious, to, to start our own stuff. We just haven't done it. And that goes back to this, this question. Yeah, right? but, but, but aren't you working on a, a particularly fixed, narrow kind of premise in relation to who's black and who isn't then, and who's Afro-Caribbean and who isn't? So Identities change all the time. Not that much. African, no, def, the African the diaspora, it meant black back in the day, it means black now. That's what it is. That's what it is. Maybe find a, a white grandmother or, or an Amerindian. I mean, What's know, the point, though? What's your point? You're, you're appealing to be purist. No, it's not purist at all. Well, it's not purist at all. I have a white grandmother, right? I have people, it's people in our family so who have white so partners. So it's, it's not what I'm trying to say, in part, if we're going to be inclusive, we need to have a language that doesn't necessarily, at the perception level, this is the but this is that, this know, is the pro this is the problem with the perception, right? Yeah, if somebody, if I say black, no, it's not. It's not an issue. It's a political issue. If I say black and that puts up white people, those white people need to go away, right? Because I know loads of white people say black and have a problem with it. No, because no, the problem, no, no, listen, let me feel. Let me feel. Let me feel. Let me feel. Being apologetic, for you no, 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 it's, it's okay to use black. No, it's what I'm saying. No, it's, this is my point that I'm making is this: what we have done, and this is definitely a black people, and in America, because America, we like to point this rosy, rosy picture. America is worse than here for racial politics. America is terrible. If you look at incarceration, murder rate, it's awful. So America's not, it's some, does some things better, but does some things poorly. What you have in common for all of us, in, and I say black, descendants of Africa that is not fixed or particularly regressive. It's very, very clearly what I meant, and very clearly what, what, how we understand black people. What our <laughs> principal problem has been is that we have spent, in the West at least, spent far too much time saying, how do we, like if you look at Martin Luther King, look at that civil rights, how do we keep the white people on board? How do we keep everybody else on board? At some point, we have to say, well, let's not worry about keeping everybody on board. Let's worry what we have to do. And then if people come along, they come along. But it's about what do we need to do and how are we going to do it? And I literally spend no time thinking about <laughs> the impact on other communities. It doesn't matter. Because no. we have to think about what we're doing for ourselves. That's what no, I'd say. No, 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 no. Can I ask a question? <laughs> you know, you look at apples. Apples got a strong brand. When you buy an apple phone, you feel emotionally connected to it. Would you say Do we not feel connected to black? No, I'm just asking. I know, it's a different question. Do we not, question do, do we not feel connected to blackness? But the question about the brand yeah. of blackness, is, you know, is it a concept that is all embracing and connects everybody emotionally? That's what I'm saying. I'd ask you. Hmm. I don't know. I, don't, I think it's interesting because 
as far as I can see, black and as far as and I've used it and I use it a lot and use it to lots of it, it is that it does connect people. People do understand that is that emotional connection. So I might be I might be wrong. So that's why I open it to other people. Is is black uh, for me? Black captures it. Black kind of get when you say black people, you know what people mean. It doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean everybody is necessarily motivated to help you and get on board. But there is an emotional connection to it. I would say it exists. I, I could be wrong, but in my experience, it does exist. But I, I don't know. What do, what do everybody? Else, what do people think about that? Because that is interesting. Well, I'm looking at the whole thing of branding. So, would you be looking at, for example, a GCSE in black studies? And whether to choose a GCSE? Yeah. Yeah. And, and then maybe an A level in black studies? Yeah. Right. And then the Greek course in black studies? Right. Okay. But, but that's formal. I, I think there's a, a, a lot of power in the informality of the black understanding as well. So, learning mm-hmm. should be different perceived in the context of formal education. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Connection that a lot of black people have um, with their identity is, 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 is because they've been sucked in and, and they watch enough TV basically. Lack of education. Exactly, lack of, lack of education, they watch too much TV. So, um, I noticed this Margaret when you do a branding, and it's, it's interesting because it, 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 <coughs> it's not a term that I would familiarize with, with people, with humans, but what, what one, one question that, that I kind of raised within myself was. You know, are we going to? If, if it's if it's a case where we where we have to rebrand blackness, for want of a better word, would we do it if it's going to do the job of, of, of giving us a more positive um, outlook on, 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 on what it is, you know, to be black and, and what it is to have the culture we have? Well, I think it's interesting actually because if you look at blackness and the emotional connection, actually, this is really important because you do have this. This idea about what blackness is and what, what authentic blackness is. And actually, this, this is one of the things which takes our young people in the wrong direction. Yeah? I was thinking back to school and says, what does it mean to be black? Um, it gets defined very negatively. Yeah, because it's because of society, because of, you know, it, it's, it's the thug image, it's that mentality, it's the street, it's the road life. Um, to mention the mean not word. But importantly, though, and this is where I think, this is why, this is why I've always thought with black as a, as a word. I've always seen young people want that emotional connection. Right, if someone says, look, I'm gonna, this is what blackness means, and I'm gonna go and be this in this really hyper, ridiculous manner that ends me up in prison, there must be an emotional connection to it, right? Because you must be saying, look, this is what, this is, this is me, I'm just not seeing myself properly. Yeah? So what we need to do is, I know branding is the right word, it's re-education. What does it mean to be black? <coughs> if we had more positive ideas about what blackness was, that young people could relate to, they probably would go down those more positive routes. But because of how we kind of, how it is understood in the media, how it is projected, how it is put across, those negative routes are ways people go there. And that's part of black studies, right? Putting out different ideas about blackness. There is a blackness which isn't there. There is much more positive, much more progressive that you can buy into to take that branding. Well, when I hear about what you've explained, like, <coughs> in terms of, it, it, no, I'm talking about in terms of how children ask a question. I, I knew the answer. I have my own answer. I want to see what your answer was. I know schools is, is, is an institution of racism. I could tell you a lot of true stories, even from my own family, of my own experience with schools. Um, and visual exam papers. So at the end of the day, it's 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 um. What was I going to say? Um. Oh God, it'll come back. Yeah, when it comes back, we'll come back. back. Yeah, young man. What I would say is that there's a positive connection to blackness, right? There's, and I've seen this young people, and again, I could be wrong, because I'm getting old now, so you never know, right? You never know. But I've always seen this connection. I want to be black. This is what I should be, right? 
There's a problem though in how that gets defined, how that gets understood. And so you're, you're right with force is probably the right word. There's a particular narrative that there is. I remember year seven in school, join the Black Brothers, the Black Brothers do this, this, this. That is what authentic blackness is. Yeah. And if you don't do that, you're not, you're not being authentically black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And people kind of, and people buy into that, right? But that's I not. Was, I was, yeah? as a, okay, personally, as a black youngster, yeah. I wasn't convinced and I was ostracized from the black group in school as a result of that. Yeah. So I never really got to hang with the black people at my school back in year seven and year eight yeah. because I knew wrong from right and I knew that what they were doing wasn't the right thing because yeah. I was fresh out of Jamaica mm. and my, my parents had told me to go back right where I was <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, and that and that happens, right? And I had that experience in year seventies. So I was actually, you know what? That don't really sound like that. Don't really sound right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay away from that. And you get, you do get, you do get that. It gets policed, right? But so the problem what I'm saying is this: Where was the organisation, the group of people who came in and said, no, 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 this is what blackness is. Black brothers means. Do you mean the parents? No, no, I'm talking well, about parents, parents, community, yeah. community. Yeah. No, 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 I'm not talking about as a community. The village. The village. I'm talking about the village. <laughs> but we have to look at as a. I have responsibility for other black. Do I have family or not? And as and this is what we haven't done is build effective organisations and things like that, right? So at the, at this point where people are saying, well, this is what blackness is. I want to be black, but it, has to, it means this. There should be someone there saying, no, 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 you can be black, but it means this. And if there was, I'm convinced they wouldn't go there now. They go this way. Yeah. Right? But it doesn't exist. And that we can't blame anybody else apart from ourselves. Well, as a community, we haven't provided different yeah, options, yeah, yeah. notions of blackness that people can buy into. We just haven't done it. Yeah. Question up front, then the lady here, and then the gentleman in the back. So you're saying that as a community, we haven't put together anything. So if, I don't know myself, you and everyone else here, because we all have <laughs> interest in black um, studies and education, if we were to sit down and put together a curriculum, would, would your organisation, Black Unity, then be prepared to instigate, incorporate it, take it to the education minister? How would we go about this? Is there a place for black women? Where are we going to start from? All right, I'll so give you a the case of us black academics getting together and putting something together. Practical thing, right? So, one of, so we've done lots and lots of, there's been lots of great work that's happened in the community over the last 50, 60 years, a long time, right? One of the things we principally failed at, and I say this failed, and it really has failed, is building effective, independent institutions. Look at our black organisations, they are, it is a terrible state. It is awful. You look at black organisations in Birmingham, the UK, terrible. Not built properly, haven't got good, haven't, don't work, all, and they've all collapsed and closed down, yeah? for the most part. The ones that exist are literally under my place. Yeah? So what we have to do as a starting point is build organisations correctly. Build organisations that can work, all right? So this is what one of the things we try to do, is organisation of black unity. Join the organisation of black unity, it's a membership-based organisation. You put money into the organisation, there's a governance structure, if you like, there's ways of working that we're trying to say, look, if you want to do, and if we want to do things, we're going to start building them. Yeah? Same thing with the Blacks Association. We have to start, it doesn't, I mean, nobody really likes this stuff because it's really boring, right? It's bo it sounds boring, let's build organisations. Without organisations, there is nothing. Yeah? Mm. So what we're saying is that, and the organisations are, are, are different because organisation of Black Unity is more community-based, does other stuff than just education. And Black Studies, um, it's not just academic, it's got an academic background too, but we're saying we want to bring this into existence, it's going to happen, join either one of these associations, organisations, and we are going to sit down, we are going to build a curriculum, we are going to <laughs> put it into a package, it is going to exist, and in 50 years time it will still be here, and these two organisations will still be thriving. That's what we have lacked as a community, principally lacked, we just don't have that, and that's what we have to focus on doing. So if you are seriously interested in doing this, it's not just a talking shop, we're going to do it, it's going to happen. Name one. You, you can tell me one and I'm wrong. I will say. Race That's not a black organization. It's not. It's not a black organization. We made ourselves fight for the same cooperator. Ahmed was three years old yesterday. All right, man. So we don't. We're not a part-time organization. Yes, ma'am. I say look, things don't have to be universal, right? So there's there's other ways to use black, which I would never use, but if people want to use them, let them use them. Yeah? Language is language. So we'd have we'd have our definition and this description of it. And other thing I would say is black root in African ancestry, I'm pretty sure that's that's how it's mostly understood, right? 
that is the predominant view. And it's not, it's only in very select circles that not the way something thinks, all right? What we have to do is then try and connect the politics back into it, so that has gone, all right? But that's partly why you do something like black studies, partly why you do something like organization of black music. But it doesn't have to be universal. It has to be an understanding that we have, an understanding that we share, and then you put that across and we can buy into it or not. But it doesn't necessarily have to be universal. So yeah. one of the facts. All right, first point. Firstly, I said the school system is fundamentally broken, right? Full, not fundamentally broken, sorry. The school system works. This isn't a place where you have black studies necessarily, all right? I'm saying that very clearly. I think black studies is something which is developed outside of the traditional school system, mainstream school system. I don't think you can develop within inside it, it's something outside it. Having said that, we are we are here. Most of, even if we had black, even if you said let's build a black school is totally separate, most black kids aren't going to a black school. And it's also, this isn't just for black kids. Black studies is generally important. The idea of having a different kind of education is generally important, all right? So we have to deal with the reality and say, look, most kids are going to go to mainstream schools. So are there ways, once we have this alternative, that can you can then work with the mainstream system? Now, you, I think that is probably possible. Maybe it's not possible. Maybe you actually say, you know, we don't want this in the mainstream system. We don't want it, all right? If that's the case, we still do it. We still do it outside. But I think we're here, and like I said, unless we are going to get on a boat and go back to Africa and start again completely, we have to just make an effort to engage in the mainstream, even if, as you say, it's a, not going to say pointless, but it's, it's difficult, right? But this case for black studies is very much to say you build it outside the mainstream system, right? You have to build it outside the mainstream because you can't build it within the mainstream system. The other issue about are the personal things people need to, um, you can't you can't do politics like that. You can't do politics like that, right? We all nobody's perfect. Nobody's no, there's no such thing as being the perfectly edu the perfectly educated cultural person who, who can then take things forward. And actually, that's one of the problems with the way that the politics, particularly the black, black left politics, if you want to call it that, has gone, where it's focused on culture. Once you free your mind, then you can free everyone else. But if you take 60 years freeing your mind, then you're dead. <laughs> and we haven't actually dealt with the structural problem. So, part, so you can't wait around to solve that. Right? Yeah, but no, this is the, but two things to say, right? One is your your personal issues are connected to the structural problems, and I'll make I'll say this one hundred percent. If you don't solve the structural problems, you can't solve people's personal issues, right? There's no way to do. So uh, we can put in lots of things in place, but at the end of the day, it's about food, it's about money, it's about housing, and those are structural problems which can only be dealt with by looking at the structure. Second thing to say is also I do agree with you, right? If you're in this situation, this is why we can't be too. This is why. These kind of things about parents, yes, parents have responsibilities and X, Y, Z, but we have to understand people as conditions which create these conditions. For example, and this is a controversial issue, right? Black fathers, where are black fathers gone? It's easy to say that the black fathers, and they have responsibility, and black fathers do have responsibility, but we're in a society where as a black man, education is very difficult, you're more likely to go to prison university, um, how you can't, it's, it's very difficult for you to provide for your family, are we surprised that there are black men in this situation have done this? Does that make sense? Well, if, you, if you have a large amount of people doing something, it is, it's far too simple to just say, oh, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. This is, again, it is, you have to have responsibility for your kids. But we have to understand that when these negative cultures emerge, they're emerging because of racism. They're emerging because of the society we live in. So what we have to do as a community is that's why the organizations are important. That's why you can't say, well, you, you can't rely on the parents to do it. 
because oftentimes parents are in that situation. So we have to build the organization that can do it if the parents can't do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Two things, right? One, definitely you have to say, and if you look at the Saturday schools, what, what they've done is about survival. There's survival mechanisms you can do within the system in order to do this. So the game you play, you play that game and you can navigate the system better. That's important. For me, it's not enough, right? For me, the idea that you have to go through these hoops in order to get the idea you have to get the trust and all that, that shouldn't be how it is, right? Mm -hmm. That is how it is, so we have to accept that's how it is and we have to accept that we have to teach our children to navigate that. But fundamentally, we're saying that shouldn't be how it is. And we should be trying to say, how do we build things differently? which is why I think we need to have a funda more fundamental changes. But I don't disagree that in the short term, you have to do that, because that's, that's just the reality of it. Yeah. But I do disagree that, there's, that we can't have a black school, right? Muslim schools are relatively recent. You said Muslim schools 50 years ago, they were looking at you and said, no chance. <laughs> Even 30 years ago, no chance. If we put together stuff properly. Well, the issue, the problem is, though, which is what we've done is, when a lot of what we have to stop stop doing is accepting the narrative. Mm -hmm. There's a narrative that says if you have a religious religion, is a base to have a school, and there's no so it's religion or a state school, essentially. Always, you pay for the school and do what you like, right? Yeah. There's another narrative. When I say black, firstly, I'm, there's a, there's a politicalness to that. But actually, it's more of a political. It's more of a, like a, it's more of a different ideology way of thinking about that. That is a perfectly legitimate basis to build schools on. We have to make the argument a perfectly legitimate basis. We have to reject this idea. Don't take the dominant narrative. Challenge it and say we can do it and it, and it can work. And the strategy, we have a strategy for this as well. Because people have tried to do this kind of Afrocentric schools through the free school legislation. Because in theory, free schools, you can make a school based on whatever you like. In practice, that's not true, right? So in practice, all these schools have been rejected very, very quickly. Haven't got the resources, haven't got the, they're not, they're not interested. So what we're saying is the way in is what we call alternative provision, pro, uh, people referral units. Hardly any regulation, much easier setup, 
So what our plan is, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a people referral unit with this idea, black school, right? And then turn, from there, turn it into a black school. So it's a different strategy of doing things. So we actually have to, we have to just be, the way we think about things has to be different. Okay, um, I see some hands <laughs> coming up here. This gentleman here, and I promise you, you're going to be the last comment because it's, really, it's getting real late. And I know um, we've been at it for about two hours. So um, you're coming to our and for the comments. If, if you make a black school and then people retaliate by making a white school and then they have more resources than us, doesn't that just put us back to the same level? Uh, What I would say to that is, would you want to take the last question then? then? Well, yeah, I mean, we are going to schedule a part two of this. <laughs> um, maybe, so, maybe on Thursday night, we've got an online on Thursday, so we can come back and do the follow-up questions. But um, um, you want to respond to that? Yeah. Or, well, and then we'll have an agenda. At the end of the day, the schools are white schools. That's what they are. Right. There are schools yeah. based on Eurocentric principles and curriculum. They are white schools. There's no way to have a white school in response to a black school, because all the schools are white schools. And, and as I said before, we have to, I just don't spend any time thinking about what the response is going to be from others. The, our question be, is this what we need to do, and do we do? And that's it. So, and that's just how I ask my mentor. All right, this is important, right? Because as I said, at some point you have to game the system and understand what it is that you can do and what it is you can't do, right? And this is a, this is a, this is different depending, right? So for example, the best mark I ever got undergraduate was when I took completely black radical perspective, deconstructed the questions, the guy loved it. I kind of knew he liked it, right? I couldn't do that with everybody. And you got to know, you got to know your people who are marking your work. It's not so much about the students, people who are marking your work. You just got to know who those people are, right? But it's, this is the point I'm making. It's these calculations we shouldn't have to make and once you have a black studies association, a black studies discipline established, we shouldn't have to make those, right? Once those are automatically on the reading list, they're automatically in the library, they're automatically getting perused, then it sh this is what I'm saying, this should hopefully deal with that issue. If you give a proper justification and legitimacy to it, that would hopefully deal with this issue, I would hope. And that's kind of one of the main reasons why we do this, right? So you don't have to jump through these hoops. You can use those different knowledge claims because they have legitimacy. Because at the minute, they don't have no legitimacy. So how do we make them have legitimacy within the system? That's it. That's and on it. that note... And if anybody wants to buy two pounds, all goes to the organisation of Black Unity. Perfect, perfect Christmas gift, so I'll just come find me afterwards. Shameless of plugging <laughs> his material. Um, before you leave, guys, guys, okay. Hello, everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is AK. Kende. And I've been tasked with a duty to give the vote of thanks. I'm sure we all had like several questions to ask. We've had, we have answered questions already, but most importantly, we want to say a very, very big thank you to Dr. Andrew for gracing this occasion with his research and his opinion. So on behalf of the Kai Mew Mew chapter of, of Omega Cypher Fraternity International, we'd like to say a big thank you to him, a big thank you to everybody for coming out as well. Thank you to the cameraman, thank you to DPS, and thank you for everybody. So good and have a good night. Thank you.